All right. So uh, Lisa mentioned, um, I work with the EPA's voluntary program. It's, uh, you may think of the EPA as kind of the regulatory uh, regulatory side of things, but for the last 20 years or so, I've been working on voluntary education programs around residential wood smoke and um, wood heat. And um, we have a, a, a program, it's called the BurnWise Education Program, and it's really about getting tools and information into homes to, to help folks uh, burn cleaner and better. Um, I'm very passionate about wood burning. I've been heating my house with wood for about 20 years on a couple of three different wood stoves and um, just love it. But um, I also, um, I'm going to touch base on this too. Um, now I have a, a, a heat pump. So I'm going to talk about some of the tools that we EPA has available today um, on um, education wise, but then also some federal funding. Uh, I'll go through the BurnWise education program real quickly. Some of the tools and information available that hopefully, you know, the wood banks will see as valuable to share with their clients. And we want to raise awareness uh, with you to understand what the what free materials, information, videos we have available to help folks. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about these uh, air source heat pumps that's uh, and uh, kind of coupling with EPA certified stove. That's kind of what I'm doing in my household now. And then the federal funds, new funds that are available that uh, to help uh, folks, most ho homeowners, 70% of the homeowners will be able to get some funding, some uh, lower households uh, um, up to $14,000. I'll talk about that. Have a little Q&A and discussion afterwards and to lead into the, the broader toolkit uh, conversation. Um, the Burn Wise program is, you know, broadly speaking, it's about educating users on how to properly use their wood burning devices and then encouraging promoting of upgrading cleaner technologies, burning the right wood typically means for us burning dry season wood, the right way, getting a good hot fire, maintaining that, and then the right appliance, EPA certified stove, pellet stove, or a cleaner technology. Uh, we've encouraged people to move if they want to move to um, heat pumps, for example, or combination. That's great too. In the past, there was a lot of emphasis on gas. There's less of that with some of the um, issues around climate and decarbonizing, et cetera. Uh, so that's kind of what the messaging behind the, the broader program is about. In terms of the available materials, again, these are all available for free to uh, our states, locals, tribes, um, nonprofit organizations, to households, quite frankly. People contact us directly. And we're trying to make sure that the firewood banks are aware of these materials. And we're working with the Alliance for Green Heat to make these available to, to all of you. Uh, and I'm going to be asking the question of how do you reach and communicate with your clients? Uh, that's kind of the one of the things I wanted to hear about. So in terms of the, the we have brochures, tear sheets, woodsheds, videos, posters, etc. Lots of materials that um, you can access. I'm going to um, go through a couple of these real quickly, and then I'll go onto the website and show you a little bit about where some of these tools are located. Um, we heard that really we needed to make available uh, some example firewood sheds. So we have some one pager fact sheets on building firewood shed storage. Uh, some of them are extendable, uh, sm smaller, a third a cord, but then you could you know, essentially take the take the right side of the of the uh, easy to build inexpensive shed and make it into an extendable one. And again, you can modify. The idea is just to give people ideas on how they can modify things that are easy and accessible. Here's a half cord one. We got one that's uh, you know a full cord. We're using pallets, uh, landscape timber, uh, cinder blocks, and and you know materials that are easy to acquire, inexpensive, and but yet can hold a decent amount of wood without costing a lot uh, and different. You can use different tarps, covers to, to keep your wood. But a lot of the messaging thing that we have is burning dry season wood, getting your um, wood up to temp your, your, your moisture content down below 20 percent um, where it's going to between 15 and 20 percent moisture content is generally the sweet spot that wood won't build, burn too fast. It doesn't burn too slow. A lot of people don't realize when you have, you know, an unsplit piece or an unseasoned uh, piece of wood, sometimes you're going to have more than 50% of the weight's going to be water. 
And, you know, I like to ask people, you know, what do we use to put out fires? So we're trying to get build awareness around, you know, why is it that we need to season wood? You know, you got wood smoke is essentially unburnt fuel, unburnt BTUs. And by the way, that same stuff is formaldehyde, benzene, fine particles, same, a lot of the same chemicals you'll find in tobacco smoke, for instance, is in um, firewood smoke. So that's, it's a lot about education and trying to just build awareness from a health and safety standpoint. We, uh, I like to bring up the safety because this motivates a lot of people when you think about, you know, what, why do, should I season my wood? You know, well, from the safety, this is a chimney. I went to, a, um, I was out in actually in uh, visiting and working with the Navajo tribe and was at a local retailer. And, and uh, this is one of the uh, blues that he pulled out of a chimney and it was essentially full of creosote. And his message on this was, he said, this is why you need to clean your stove and pipe every year. The customer was complaining about smoke coming into the house. Again, kind of an air quality safety issue, carbon monoxide, fine particles, benzene. You don't want to breathe it. I would say the message really should be, you should be seasoning your wood, splitting your wood, stacking your wood. And yes, getting it inspected, your, your clients. But really, what you really need to do is burn dry seasoned wood, get a good hot fire, hopefully use a, a, an EPA uh, energy efficient cleaner burning stove. Um, examples of the materials we have some videos, brochures on split stack cover store, uh, how to essentially test your properly test firewood. And that is to test it, you really need a, a, a basic wood moisture, uh, a wood moisture meter. Uh, you know, you can get them for 30 bucks, split the wood, and then test the freshly side split side. That's the key is not to grab a piece that's been sitting idle by itself and expect it to represent the outside is going to almost always be drier. So we have a simple um, um, brochure, flyer, excuse me, and video that explains uh, how to go about doing this. And you can link to those things, for example, the videos from your website, if you have one or from Facebook, or if you send out information. Otherwise, we have hard copies available for folks. Uh, we do education around, you know, trying to encourage and support upgrading your old appliance to a cleaner uh, appliance, EPA certified wood stoves, getting them pr properly and professionally installed so that, you, you know, you get it um, so it's safe and operational. Um, EPA certified stoves, advanced technology stoves, when they're operated uh, correctly, put in the right fuel, they're, they're great. Um, we have brochure on, on this, uh, on on you know EPA certified stoves also and the benefits associated with them. Real quickly, wanted to um, show you the website that we have just so you can navigate a little bit. We have how to you know watch how to watch videos or watch videos and different videos we have. Order your free materials are down below here. Um, I'll maybe pop into this real quickly. See, hopefully this will I can go back quickly easily. But the website is um you can check it out burn wise again you can go here and order your free materials and um or you know contact alliance for green heat and we'll get those to you now my trick of getting back to my powerpoint oh boy who's got who's what who's smarter than me Uh, let's see. X out you of burn. Just, you might just have to X, get out. Just of X out of X out of the burn wise. Thank you, wise man or women, whoever helped out with that. I just wanted to give you a visual so you could feel comfortable going to there. Um, I'm going to stop there real quickly and see if anybody has any questions on those slides. And I'm going to jump into the quickly over the, the funding and heat pumps a little bit about that. Um, but I wanted to see if anybody had any comments and questions real quickly. I don't see any in the chat, but if you if you have a question, feel free to. Yeah, that's a great okay. way to do it. Feel, pop, it pop in any questions or comments or thoughts around uh, any material I cover. And uh, but otherwise, I'll go ahead and jump on to the next next slide here. Sounds great. Um, so the idea there, because there is going to be, and there 
there really is over the next couple of years and starting this year, there's going to be a lot of funding um, for electric heat pumps and and also funding for upgrading appliances and some pro with some programs. And there's tax credits for biomass up to 30 percent. I'm thinking about getting a new stove, a new hybrid stove. I've got a secondary combustion stove. I haven't had a, a dual uh, a hybrid stove and I'm kind of curious. So I can get a tax credit of, of um, up to, I think, two thousand dollars. 30% of the installation, but there are also grant dollars I'm going to make you aware of for um, for funding of wood stoves and um, also heat pumps and direct point of sale rebates. But for those that aren't familiar, the electric heat pumps essentially transferring, you know, um, heat from the, well, heat pump can either you know, it moves air. It doesn't create air. That's kind of the simple way. Uh, this is a mini split, ductless mini split, where the compressor's outside, the indoor air units inside use a refrigerant to, to essentially move cold air when during the um, summer months, um, excuse me, warm air from the summer months to the outside, and then warm air into the house during the winter months. And even in cold climates, the state of Maine is leading the country in cold climate heat pump installations. A lot of people are coupling their wood wood heaters using that as a backup, a supplement, and using the um, heat pump during uh, other times. So uh, it's it's happening in cold climates. Heat pumps are compared to, you know, 10 years ago, these uh, modulating inverters, the refrigerants, um, they're, they're, they, they're a lot more energy efficient and can actually heat uh, quite efficiently during the, uh, the, the colder climate, uh, colder days. In terms of the funding that's available, I wanted to make this make you aware of uh, two programs. The EPA has uh, the Environmental Justice Thriving Communities Grant Maker Program. I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a minute. And then the Department of Energy's Home Energy Rebate Program. Uh, this is perhaps the, the most, uh, the simplest and best avenue of upgrading to certainly installing a heat pump for lower income households um, for potentially um, little to no money. I'll, I'll, I'll break this down. I'm going to talk about, I, the, the, there's essentially a, a program where it's $4.37 billion distributed among the states and tribal governments to support lower income households and other households that are not kind of middle low, middle income where you can get up to $8,000 point of sale rebate for a heat pump and then $4,000 for your essentially electric panel and wiring so $12,000 right there for getting and that should generally speaking cover the purchase and installation of a certainly a single head single unit um, depending on your circumstances. And then there's also available money up to $1,600 for insulation, ventilation, air sealing, et cetera. So there's a good bit of money available. And, I, and some of your clients could very well be interested in this. Um, so know that this program and what I'm just going to say is your state energy program, most of the states have a something on their website that indicates that this program is coming. The states are in the process of receiving the money. Some of them have already been awarded um, across the country. And there is a website that when you get these slides, you can click on right here <clears throat> and it'll bring you to your state's um, status. But simply, I'm, my point is pay attention to your energy department or your state's program on home energy rebate because this is going to become available uh, this 2024 in almost every state of the country where people with lower incomes will be able to really take advantage of this. That's the DOE um, program. EPA has what's called a Thriving um, Communities Grant Makers Grant Program. 11 entities um, have received larger grants of about $50 million each. And they are going to make um, an open competition for smaller uh, organizations. The intention is to make this to small organizations 
and make and essentially reduce the burden of what a lot of federal grant processes are. The intention, this the intention is to make this streamline so that small community-based organizations, local organizations can come in and get funding anywhere from $150,000. $250,000 to $350,000 and to help, you know, support various programs. It's, it's pretty broad in terms of as long as it's addressing environmental uh, issues, it could be water, air. But in our case, we're talking about maybe getting people's um, who, you know, more cleaner, safer technology to heat with, to weatherize their homes. So, just know that this is available <laughs> and um, where do you find out more information around this? You can go to EPA's Thriving Community Grantmakers Subaward and then to submit, you can actually um, submit questions and find out more about this. Uh, each uh, region, each part of the country has a grant maker. If you're in the state of Maine or Minnesota, you'll have a different grant maker. But it'll, that that you can find that information on site. In terms of DOE's home energy rebate site, I give you a couple of um, uh, links here. There's a place where you can send questions in. But more practically speaking, I would just say go to your state's energy department website and keep track of when they're and, and then look and be ready for that. And we will probably um, Alliance for Green Heat will be sharing information about this in other ways on the newsletters. And you'll probably hear from me maybe when all of a sudden this stuff is really hitting, we'll remind people so we don't miss the opportunity so that some of these clients who really are in need can take advantage of these programs and we don't miss out. There are also community action programs locally. Those are the folks who help with uh, low income uh, weatherization programs in almost every county across the country. And they deal with uh, DOE's weatherization programs and the Health and Human Services Home Energy Assistance Program, helping people pay their winter bills. So some of you are already probably familiar with the DOE WAP program, weatherization program, and maybe the LIHEAP program, because they provide you know, funding to people to purchase firewood sometimes or propane. Um, so those are some organizations to maybe connect with and partner with uh, around this these topics. And then, again, I, I'd really like to hear from you all on what's the best way to communicate um, and, and provide information and share information with your clients. Um, again, we have uh, videos, brochures, flyers. You know, what is it would make the most sense? Alicia, that's it um, for me. I could say more, of course, but I'll stop there and hope we can have a few questions and answer. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll be sure to share your contact information if that's all right, Larry, so that people can get in touch Absolutely. With you yeah. And I, Great. I recognize that was a lot of information and you're like, whoa, what's all that about? <laughs> so we're, we will come back to you and there will be more information, but just at least to know that some of these things are happening and you'll have a, hopefully an opportunity to maybe connect with some of your your organization with some of these uh, programs. That's wonderful. Well, if you want to, if you want to stop sharing your screen, we can. Thank you. Yes. Open stop it up sharing. to open it up to the group. Are there any questions about the um, programs that that Larry's been talking about, or the Burnwise materials that might be a good resource for all of your your wood banks or your um, the organizations well, that you're working with. So this is Kevin Brady with the Nativity Wood Bank in Bend, Oregon. Thanks, if I yeah. understood in essence what Larry was saying was that there's a series of additional programs coming that actually might step outside a little bit of the direct mission of a wood bank where we can help people with, with weatherization or possibly help them uh, uh, move into a different form of heat or something of that nature is that what I understood? I didn't get all the detail, but yeah, yeah, Kevin, that's a great question. And in 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 essence, hopefully, and in, in some some wood banks are not going to have the capacity to, to share additional information about you know a, an opportunity to weatherize your home or get a heat pump, uh, and that's understandable. But 
But for those that have the capacity and the ability to share and make sure that their clients who they know really could take it, could really take advantage of like the DOE home energy rebate point of sale uh, program, you know, hopefully we can, we, this can be a conduit to get them. And if nothing else, tell them, hey, this is who you can contact in Bend, Oregon, uh, or the state of Oregon to, to take advantage of this. And maybe that's a, it's an email or a flyer, who knows, but yeah, they're going to, there's going to be a lot from this Inflation Reduction Act that was passed, you know, a year and or so ago that will allow some folks who are otherwise struggling with heating their homes because either weatherization or they have an old appliance, uh, you know, that they or old electrical wiring that they may need to upgrade if they need to get, uh, if they want to get a, a you know a, a, a heat pump to supplement to complement the heat pumps, I, I'll, I'll say also is that in um, Oak Ridge, Oregon, we got a program going, and uh, the the number one thing they have a lot. It's in one of those valleys that's just got a lot of wood smoke in wintertime in, inversions problems. They're the folks are loving the heat pumps because during the summer they can use them for cooling. Yeah. And the wood smoke comes into place. Yeah. And they during the they can shut their windows. They can use the heat pump to cool their house, and it's just getting you know some of these heat events. So it's both a heating and cooling um, appliance. So so how about things like one of the things that we've considered doing, uh, but have not been able to fund is uh, a program for chimney sweeps for our clients, right? And uh, is and I know that that has not been available through the through the regular grant that we're talking about, but is that something that might be we might be able to coordinate? And that would be under that sub that uh, grant makers program. That would be the kind of thing that you could say, you know, maybe for a hunt, you know, want to yes, I, I would, I would say that that's the kind of thing that if it's pitched as you know, look, they'll they'll come out with kind of how to what criteria they're looking for. And you know, health and safety. You know, certainly it's it's likely, and I can't guarantee it, but that's the kind of program that could potentially be funded under that sub award grant program. And you can inquire uh, about that with the folks when they come out. They're going to send out some details from your regional sub grant maker. They'll put out an application saying, "Hey, we're looking for applications now from 150 thousand to two three fifty." What are the kind of programs? And they're they're supposed to make it easy on the smaller community-based organizations. So yes, absolutely. You know, you could couple that with, um, you know, you know so do that, some that education. Might good, that might be a good addition to the, to what the Green Heat people are doing. Um, is maybe a separate piece of it um, along those lines. Um, I, I don't know if I would have the 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 um, or if my team would have the, the right. administrative people to be able to manage a program. Um, right. You know, of all that sort of stuff, we can certainly manage the clients and we can certainly work with the clients to make sure the stuff is available. But mm -hmm. uh, to actually, you know, the other end of it, managing all that stuff, I understand they're trying to make an easy way to do it. And that would be something <laughs> to understand. But maybe that Green Heat people could, could participate in that also. Hint, hint. Yeah. I Kevin, I think with the, the intention is because of, I mean, what just what you just said, it's hard. It, you haven't done something like this, it may be hard. If you can also look for another smaller nonprofit organization that maybe has something similar going on, you know, another, um, you know, nonprofit organization that maybe has a little bit more capacity um, or even a local government yeah. potentially you could work with and say, hey, we want to apply with you and have them take the burden of. And so you can bring ideas with them They and they're looking for collaboration. They want to see that kind of working with a small and you one community based organization working with another or with a local government. That's kind of the intention. Uh, so certainly is one way to go about it. Oh, but we should just be expecting more information in the not too distant future. Is That's that right. More more of it. Yeah. And Dan Smith pointed out the the community action programs that I'd mentioned that do administer the. Um, Low-income weatherization, low-income home energy assistance programs, the LIHEAP programs, they may be a partner that could could work with you. They may have the capacity. Thank you, Dan. That's a great recommendation. Uh, but just making that connection, maybe now is the time to start knocking on a door and say, hey, um, we understand this is coming. Is this something you might be work, willing to work with us on? Um, 
and in the summer of 2024 is when those applications will probably be uh, opportunity to apply for those funds will probably come out. So another question that you had, Larry, I think was about was about communication about how people how people get information out to to their um, Wood Bank users or or clients. Um, and so if if anybody wants to jump in and and mention that. And I appreciated Kevin that you introduced yourself and your Wood Bank before you you spoke. If anybody wants to do that, that would be wonderful too. Say where you're from. How about can I get a thumbs up or a thumbs down from the least people I can see? Do you got? Do you all email folks? All right. So a mixture. Some are emailing, and that's. You know, that's what I certainly use. And so, for example, the idea you could be, you know, part of this, you know, idea was that we, how do we maybe share more that's not take, doesn't take too much energy. So sending folks information about, you know, hey, there's this DOE program that you are, you could potentially apply for and get $14,000. That may come down the line where we just, working through Alliance for Green Heat, we'll probably put together a, a standard email that says, hey, this funding is now available and share it with you all and you can forward it to those folks. Or, hey, maybe once every month or so you say something, here's a document or a video on split stack cover and store. You wanna learn how to test your wood moisture? Here, watch this video. You know, if you're sending stuff out every now and again. So that's, you know, so having the emails one way, some people do Facebook. How about Facebook? Anybody doing Facebook? Okay, we got a couple of Facebook fo folks. Um, I don't do Facebook. My wife does. Um, social media. How about Twitter and Instagram? All right. My kind of communicators because I don't either. But it sounds like email is certainly a lot of uh, what we have going. But And, and I think Alliance for Green Heat wants to know this. Um, we I've been talking with them because we're trying to figure out how best to get information that could be valuable to help people, you know, figure out some inexpensive ways to store the wood um, using the, some of these uh, plans that we put out there. Um, so, all right. Alicia, I think you gave me a little bit more time than I was allocated. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. And I, I know we've been talking about um, wood banks as information hubs for, for other kinds of, other kinds of resources as well. So this is this is a great start to that. Okay. So thank you so much, Larry, for, yeah. for introducing those those programs. And don't hesitate. If anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to give me a call, send me an email. And this is kind of the beginning of when hopefully information does become a little bit more timely and actionable. We'll have this venue and opportunity through the Alliance for Green Heat and this kind of forum to to, to share with you more than anything, just wanted to kind of at least give you a heads up that there's some opportunities. That's wonderful. <laughs> we got thumbs up from, from around across the board here. Oh, great. Um, so we have, we have a large group here. Um, I think, I think the, the best thing to, to do will be to jump into questions um and other comments um rather than introduce everyone um even though I'd like to like to hear where you're all from um if you'd like to to type that into the chat that would be fun um where everyone's coming from but um the there were a large number of questions that came in um through the registrations and a couple of them were, I think, I think three or four were very broad. Basically, how do we start? How do you begin a wood bank? Um, so those are those are sort of the big broad questions. How do we get wood? Um, how do you organize a work day? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, and then, and then onward into safety training for volunteers. Um, so these are all questions that I'd love to hear from you all. Um, 
how did you get started? And uh, what what sort of a volunteer base do you have? Where do you find the volunteers? Um, so if there are particular, oh great, we've got Missouri, we have Idaho, uh, Brunswick, Maine, Peterborough, New Hampshire, this is wonderful. It's nice to have everybody here. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to start off with if you could just say your your name, your wood bank, and how did you start? What, what was what's a what's a pearl of wisdom that you can share with with folks who are trying to start up a wood bank now? Um, experiences that you had, good and bad. Well, it's hard to be the first. All I'll, right, I'll, be, I'll be the first just to, to <laughs> get people started. Again, this is Kevin Brady with Nativity Wood Bank in Bend, Oregon. Uh, we've actually been um, servicing folks for 18 or 19 years. Um, and we actually started, uh, we're, we're based at the Nativity Lutheran Church here in Bend, but we uh, are not necessarily members of the church, okay? Um, but it started uh, where uh, we had a local land order who, landowner who had a bunch of uh, folks uh, camping on his land and it got to be uh, 10 below zero one night and, and he said hey people are freezing and so we just started taking personal wood out uh, to some of these folks um, and uh, it, it grew from there. One of the key elements that we've got in, in, in doing this is that we've got a couple of, of uh, driving motivated folks that are our volunteer board, you know, people that really have set up their their Saturdays to be this, right? And they're the people that are really driving it, really interested on a regular basis. Um, and uh, so, you know, getting started, it, it took some, I mean, we had a real defined need, but we also had some people who were willing to step up the line and make it happen. Uh, it was kind of grown from there. Uh, we do get support from the community uh, as we're, you know, get more and more known, we've gotten gotten support from the community in uh, in donations. Somebody's got an old chainsaw they want to get rid of, or a splitter. You know, we've been able to buy for half price or something of that nature. It's just kind of grown on top of that. But the, the real element has been a been a group of people that are really willing to get in there and make it happen. I don't know if that helped or not, but. The specific questions? Oh, that's great. Stun silence. <laughs> yeah, Gil, please. There, am I on? Okay. Um, I just have an observation. Those of you uh, maybe... A lot of you have experienced the storms of this past month. In Maine, the coastal Maine has been decimated. Castine, where I live, has firstly lost its entire waterfront. And the waterfront is a source of, obviously, summer income, which in the past has been largely responsible for their annual income. I'm mentioning this because I, don't, I think this might be a prime time to get the public involved through conferences, seminars, whatever. Uh, I'd be a little, call it shy or whatever, to put together a meaningful, say, 30-minute presentation in person uh, here in Castine. What we have uh, as an asset, hardly touched asset, is the Maine Maritime Academy but with about a thousand students. And uh, there are issues there because the students are so busy, they can hardly have time to eat breakfast, let alone chop wood. Uh, and uh, so the target could be the students, but recognizing their 
uh, time constraints, uh, maybe the the faculty and staff. But anyway, so I guess uh, I don't know if Alyssa could do this, but uh, if somebody could take today's presentation or other presentations and boil it down to what are the really key points? What are the uh, issues that somebody who's never heard of a food food of a wood bank uh, would uh, enjoy hearing? So that's. Uh, but I think this the climate change has hit home in this town and along the coast, many coastlines. So. <clears throat> Thanks, okay. Gil. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I I wonder if other if others have um, ideas or or experience with uh, spreading the word of the wood bank and and recruiting volunteers. If that's been an issue or a strength that your wood bank. I I can chime in on that because I've got two wood banks under my belt so far. Um, and Cumberland is, uh, we've built the wood bank on the premise of the, the church in, in town. And the minister was approving the, um, the recipients of the wood and the, um, the participants, the volunteers, Years, we got about 80 volunteers from within the church, but also uh, outside of the church. And it's probably being run uh, by the principals of the Wood Bank uh, who are non affiliated with the church. Uh, to, at this point, um, but we got over over a hundred cords a year pre uh, pandemic, and um, flipping over to the the mid coast wood bank, which we started uh, really. I started three years ago when I first moved to the Brunswick area, and um, we we have Bowdoin College in Brunswick, and they are verbally a, a good partner for potential volunteers but also for potential wood because they own quite a bit of real estate in the area um, as well. And they're meticulous about their grounds keeping and so forth. Um, but uh, as far as finding a staging area or a site, uh, I've been banging up against a brick wall when dealing with the towns and the nonprofit organizations that have land. Uh, for instance, there's a, a, a retired Navy base, air base uh, in the Brunswick area that um, they have a thousands of acres of space available, and there was uh, a theme of the board needing to make the decision, and it was tied up in a long process of review and this was repeated over and over again by the types of organizations that I was going toward. Uh, and I flipped it around and the 
the Cumberland Wood Bank has a contractor that has dedicated space. And as soon as I went to a local contractor in this area, he came back in 24 hours and had six sites that he would offer to me. And we then got the insurance, which is a big problem for wood banks. And we, we got the equipment donated from a large tree company that uh, gave me three brand new chainsaws and uh, half a dozen chaps and helmets for safety reasons. Um, and so that took off uh, and and really launched the the program because I dealt with a private individual rather than a board of directors. And like the government, there's no decisions made easily uh, by, by anybody. Uh, so the volunteers are few and far between in the mid coast area. And if I have a half a dozen core volunteers that I can count on every week, but certainly not the 80 that I had from Cumberland that, um, and this is a challenge in this area. Um, and so if anybody has any ideas, uh, I, I would be open to hearing what is working. Thanks, Bruce. Do we have any Sorry, other? I took so much time. No, no. <laughs> They're good stories to hear, I think. Does anybody else have any um oh we've we've got some great comments coming in on the in the chat too. Um James says that advertising through local newspaper and local public television was a great way to to advertise um the Wood Bank and they they looked for an interview with you. Is that what you said, James? Yes. They Can found you hear out me? Yes. Okay. I, I had some other things to say as well, Elisa. First and foremost, you know, I, I, I started, me and another man just started giving firewood away. And others found out about it. Um, and they wanted to participate. And then we started having lumberjack breakfast together, you know, to kind of go out the day where we're going to do some work and then coordinate deliveries of the small amount that we had amassed over the summer the next year. And it kept growing and growing. And then another nonprofit heard about what we were doing. And then they wanted to know how they could help. And now they're a, a funding source for us every year. Um, what was said about a core group of a few people is true. However, if you advertise and have maybe two work days to get the wood prepared, you may get those large volumes of people, especially if you give them a lumberjack breakfast. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, you, in four or five hours, it's amazing how much work can get done. Um, and then deliveries, inviting other people to see the circumstances that you're making the delivery to so that they see the heart behind the ministry and the need that's out there. People don't realize, at least in the Northeast, I don't know about other parts of the country, but in the Northeast, um, there certainly is a need. We have other 
wood banks in our area, some much larger than us. We're kind of scattered about, but the need's out there. So when people see that, and it's a kind of action type thing, um, not that we don't have women involved because we do, but it's a real guy uh, thing. You know, it's some something that they can do um, that they seem to embrace. That's that's all. And like I said, people wanted to interview us. The 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 local community likes good stories to put on once in a while. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of doom and gloom out there, but when they see volunteers doing something worthwhile in the community that's a great human interest story for them. So they came to us. Um, and then, you know, you, you leave a business card, you make a business card and you give it to the people who get the wood and you give it to, I volunteered at the hospital. So the card's there and, and another chaplain heard about it and found out a person who needed wood. It just grew from word of mouth in a lot of ways. And well, then other you, chaplain, well, just to pick up on what you're saying, James, is that one of the things we've had a lot of success in building the volunteer base is really trying to establish a sense of community around it. So oh, yeah. we always try to have a break where people can sit and have coffee. Uh, in the summertime, we have a picnic table set out where people can sit and have a beer after we've done our work on Saturday. So we right. work hard to build that sense of community. Well, we've even had a men's group come together instead of, uh, you know, we had to breakfast, but they wanted to barbecue hamburgers and hot dogs and yeah. stuff for the people yeah. afterwards yeah. Um, to promote their organization. And they come in and did that all for free. So that was yeah. really nice too. Well, so good. yeah, I guess it kind of dovetails with other organizations that are doing charitable work. I don't know if that helps anybody. Where are you based, James? We're based in central Pennsylvania. Yes. One thing that I will add that Cumberland has done very successfully is gone out to corporate partners that provide their employees a community work day. And they've we've got IDEX, which is a publicly traded company. Uh, about a thousand employees, and they they uh, regularly send in the spring and the fall uh, fifteen or twenty employees who spend the day uh, during the week, and they set that up uh, so that we have a a, a representative there uh, coordinating what they have for a list of projects. And it, it really, it's, we've become very dependent uh, upon them carrying the, the processing of the wood uh, to the level, um, and then it's two or three companies that have have done this uh, repeatedly for Cumberland, and and I certainly have been a couple of well, BIW Bath Iron Works is a big employer. Uh, in the area, and hopefully we can get a day where 15 or 20 people can come and process the wood and, and uh, do that, so. I see a hand raised by Justin. Hey, good morning, everyone. I know it's afternoon to, to some of you, a lot of you. I'm calling in from Alaska, Southeast Alaska. And um, <clears throat> yeah, my 
director of our tribal tribal government here, the Organized Village Cake, just forwarded me this email. So I thought I would uh, check it out and see what, see what was about what it was about. It's pretty interesting. And I came in, put in here for a little over a year, and they have a wood project where where some of the funding was from ARPA and uh, from COVID relief. And so that was nice. You know, the tribal council allocated uh, 50000 for 23 and then 50000 for 24, <clears throat> 2024. And so I was involved in, in uh, 2023's um, wood project. And so with that, you know, we had uh, permits and agreements with the Forest Service and had we had nine nine permits. Each one of them were good for twenty five cords of wood, and so we hauled in quite a bit of quite a bit of wood, and um, had a crew working under that ARPA the ARPA funds, um, bucking them up and splitting them, and then hauling them to to homes. We hauled we hauled a cord of wood to sixty seven households in our village. We're disconnect. We're uh, not connected to the mainland, so we have a, a population of probably about five hundred. So that was a lot of wood hauled, and we got a big woodshed stacked and stockpiled with about holds about 30 cords, and then some on the outside as well. So that the intention of this was just to have an emergency stockpile for the cold snaps when people um, ran out of wood, you know, and couldn't get it for themselves. And so we have a, we have a lot of that elders who need it, people as they're you know they're burning as their primary source, but don't really have a source of uh, a means to go out and get it. So it's been nice, you know, and I've heard some ideas today already, you know, as far as it, um, maybe grants to to further this program. I never thought about it as any more than just having the stockpile of wood for people to to get when they need it. But uh, it's kind of, like I said, just very interesting, you know, to want, it has inspires me to look for additional funding. You know, I heard some, I was in and out of the conversations doing some other stuff here, but uh I think that'd be worth, you know, uh, building up this program somehow to, I heard some about, you know, gatherings for volunteers. We got people that would like to volunteer and we can't haul wood for, for, uh, cause we ran out of funds. We can't haul wood, you know, and cut and split and haul wood anymore. And so it's up to the homeowners to households to find their own means to their own truck, you know, to come and, and grab wood when they need it. So I like that idea, you know, having a gathering for uh, volunteers in the community because we have a lot of people that would volunteer, haul wood, come and stack and load, whatever. Uh, we're hopefully, you know, we can keep this up from year to year because it really came in handy. We had a, had a couple of cold spells just in the past few weeks, you know, that uh, and people burn through wood really fast. You know, some of this wood, just looking at... Uh, you know, the, the safety precautions with burning wood. A lot of this wood was probably 50%, 50 or 60% um, um, wet, you know. And so that's something, I heard something about uh, chimney cleaning, and that's something that no one really does here. You know, people have had chimneys up for, for many years and has never never cleaned them until it's time, you know, until it's soot's coming in, the exhaust is coming in, or it's just not burning right. So it you know, uh, has me inspired to, you know, look for additional funding to where we can possibly have a chimney sweep, get more volunteers in, involved, education, you know, as far as, you know, that burning dry wood compared to damp wood or wet wood. I think it's very, um, a very important information to have out there. One of those moisture, uh, moisture, wood moisture meters is definitely, you know, something I think we're going to get as a, as an organization. So we can tell the people, you know, how much, how how moist, what percentage of moisture is in the wood. But yeah, I just wanted to put that out there uh, and, and, and welcome any other suggestions or ideas on how we could possibly grow this. Right now, it's just limited to a seasonal thing when uh, in, in using these, these ARPA funds, and that's about it. But it'd be nice if we can find some additional funding because that's not going to last forever. And to really build this up and to... Um, taken in, you know, a couple of different directions than just, you know, a stockpile of wood to come and get when they're, when they run out. So I just wanted to put that in there and, and again, welcome any ideas, suggestions, uh, and advice. I'm open to it. Thank you. And I'm glad you guys are having this, having this gathering in this meeting. Thanks so much, Justin. I'm glad you could make it. And at least I just want to, if it's okay, uh, jump in. Justin, thanks for the feedback and um, what probably 
I could spend more time than we have, but uh, maybe we should follow up. I can certainly provide you and connect you with some folks there in Seattle office EPA that can hopefully provide some direct support to you guys and keep you updated um, so you know what's happening when. And we'll we'll, we'll continue to do so through this uh, venue also, but we can maybe connect you more closely with some folks on the ground. Likewise, anybody else that's interested. Um, so that's it. Thanks. Yeah, and we're we're coming up on the end of our our hour here. I feel like we could talk for another hour or more about this. Um, and speaking of which, we're we're gonna try to do some regional, more regional based discussions in the early part of February. Um, so please look that up if you're if you're interested. Um, and Ed asks, how can we access the links in the chat afterward? I will definitely share all of those in a follow up email. Um, after this session, and and I'll share the the recording as well, um, if if all are amenable to that. So I will I will be in touch about the the regional the regional discussions, um, and people can join in your region or as many of those as you would like to get more ideas from from or across the continent. Um, and thank you all so much for for joining in on this discussion. Thank you to Larry for sharing your your knowledge and expertise and your resources. And I hope that people will, and anybody who is connected to Facebook, will uh, jump in there and and add their their wisdom there um, to the Firewood Banks Facebook group. We also have a Google group started, um, and I'll put a link to that in the follow up email. Um, and any other ways that we can share information if, if you have ideas about how we can um, share our experiences, our ideas, our questions. I am open to that always. Does anyone have any last thoughts? I just have one real question, real quick question. Um, does anyone work with loggers as far as uh, residual woods like brad wood on logging decks or any timber stand improvement work actually from the timberland in order to furnish wood for your programs i've heard a lot about storage areas and wood coming in there but i just wonder about from the woods themselves as a source thank you yeah we have uh in the past worked with the forest service pulled in a couple of wood decks uh we ended up having to hire a uh, uh a logger with a self-loading truck to go pick them up um and uh I don't remember, you know, how we can, you know, part, part, well, a couple of our members are part of the Forest Service, so that's probably how we got our contact through it, to it. Um, but yeah, it is possible to do that. We've had our best luck in getting lumber through uh, uh, arborists, you know, and we live in a, in a community of about 200,000 people, so we've got a lot of people cutting trees down, so that's where we get most of our stuff, the local, okay. local uh, tree service guys, because they got to pay to get rid of the woods, so they're happy to give it to us. Thank you. Hey, Elisa. Um, yes. John, I may have missed this earlier, but another way to share info, uh, in addition to the um, Facebook site, is we have a new newsletter. It's just dedicated to firewood banks that Darian Dyer is putting out. Did this come up earlier? I may have missed it. No, no, it hasn't. Please. Okay. So anyway, it's um, hopefully most of you are already on it, but if you're not, you can go to the uh, firewood bank website and sign up and um so anything that elisa is doing all of these events they will be on that newsletter so it's a good place to check to make sure you're not missing one of these uh webinars and also if you have stories you want to share inspirational stories darian is always looking for um good stories to share to help other banks so banks that you know don't show up to things like this we hope, you know, maybe still reading the newsletter or something and, and we could uh, share some of the good advice that's come out today in uh, in that place, too. Hey, Darian, you want to mention anything else? Nope, just that I put the link um, where you can put your email in and make sure you're on that newsletter next time it goes out next month. Perfect. Thank you, Darian. And thank you again, everyone, for coming. Um, I, I really appreciate seeing faces from all over the place here. So thank you. And, and I hope to see you next time too.